So we're going to talk about the basic terminology, uh, the biochemistry, and I'm not, I assure you I'm not going to go into as much detail as Dr. Biddle did this morning, so you don't have to fall asleep on me right now. Uh, more importantly, we'll talk about the on and off label uses, how to use EDTA in practice, the benefits, risks, and uh, we'll go over some case studies. So why, uh, what is EDTA chelation therapy? It's basically an IV treatment that's FDA approved for use in removing heavy metals if it's calcium EDTA. And it's for treating hypercalcemia and ventricular arrhythmias secondary to digitalis toxicity if it's disodium EDTA. And what I hope that you'll all go away with is knowing the difference between calcium EDTA and disodium EDTA. That's really important to know that difference. Now, the non-FDA approved uses, or are the off-label uses that we're going to be focusing on, is that EDTA is an antioxidant. That's why it's put in food as a preservative. And it might help to manage conditions that go along with heart disease. Chelation therapy is sort of what ACAM is known for. We've been teaching chelation therapy in different aspects for 30 years, and uh, it all goes back to the, the, the discovery of chelation. And it, when it was originally discovered, it was a likened to it was described as one molecule binding on to another one, sort of like the, cl the claw of a crab. And that's what the name chelate comes from, the Latin or Greek word chel. And then Morgan and Drew were the researchers who discovered chelation therapy as the incorporation of a metal ion into a heterocyclic ring structure. And in, chem in, in nature, there are chelates that we know about, like chlorophyll is a chelate of magnesium. And if you look at your picture, you see there's a nice little magnesium molecule inside of this structure, which looks a lot like hemoglobin. And that shows that hemoglobin is a chelate of iron. And what we're doing is we are using that same principle to help pull out heavy metals. I, I swear to you, I'm not getting into a lot of biochemistry terminology today, but we do need to know what an ion is, which is a charged particle. Cation is a positively charged molecule. Anion is a negative charged particle. EDTA stands for ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid, and it's an octahedral structure. It has eight sides, and it has six electron groups from which it can do its magic. By binding the positions, the cation is surrounded by the EDTA molecule. So that, in the calcium EDTA picture that's up here, you can see how this positively charged calcium molecule is surrounded by this EDTA, and this is called calcium EDTA. And it's very similar to how hemoglobin looks. There's a lot of factors that are involved with determining how successful you're going to be with your chelation therapy. pH is very important. We've heard that you want to alkalinize a person's body before you do detoxification. Well, with EDTA chelation, that's also true. Because when the pH is acidic, that makes the molecules bind less strongly with EDTA. When the body is more alkaline, EDTA works more effectively. Binding constants are important as well in determining what heavy metals come out with the chelation process. The higher the binding constant, the stronger the cation or mineral or heavy metal is bound to EDTA. And concentration is also important. The higher the concentration of the heavy metal, the more likely it is to bind to EDTA, and we'll go into why that's really important. These are what the binding constants are on a table. And if you look at it, you'll notice that 
there are some that are highlighted. So whoever is taking the test might want to focus on that. Now, iron is a very has a very high binding constant, and that means that if a person is anemic and you're doing chelation therapy, then you have to be careful about making them more anemic. Mercury has a high binding constant as well in a test tube. But we're going to talk about why it doesn't necessarily have a, the same effect in the body. And then zinc has a very high binding constant, which is important to know as you're doing chelation because you can make people zinc deficient pretty quickly if you're not replacing that as part of your process. And notice the very lowest binding constants belong to calcium and magnesium. And so that's nice to know because when you're giving calcium EDTA, you know that the calcium sort of gets displaced for the other heavy metals, which have a stronger binding constant. So the special considerations for what happens inside of the body compared to what happens in the test tube is really important for practical application. Even though pH is really important in the test tube, in the body, it's not necessarily as much of an issue because our bodies are very tri tightly controlled organisms, and we try to keep pH within a certain range. We know that we want it to be around 7.2 to 7.4. Uh, people take a lot of, uh, people go through the process of checking their urine pH or their saliva pH, and I do think there's a lot of utility in that because that does tell us whether a person is more tending to being acidic. So even though in a test tube it's really important to monitor the pH, in the body it's not necessarily, uh, doesn't necessarily have the same impact, but still at the bottom line is you want the pH to be alkaline and that's when the chelation is going to work the most effectively.